Ti. So, um, yeah, my interest really is in the overlooked and disregarded parts of nature um, and how we as urban people especially can connect with it and find a bit of a more sensitive connection really. So I'm going to stop wittering and see what's in the traps today. Um, obviously I checked them earlier, the sun is coming up now and it's a bit, that can be a bit dangerous for moths if they get sort of overheated in here. So let's just take off the perspex and see what we've got. The sun's in my eyes so I can't really tell. You can see there's an angle shades down there right away. So we can zoom in on in. Her. Beautiful moth. They're quite common. Um, we get a lot of them at the moment. Um, wonderful sort of scrawled paper look. I'll see if I can get them out a bit later and take them downstairs and we can have a look. That's a, a polyphagous moth, so eats all sorts of things, roses and herbaceous shrubs. Um, and you might well find their caterpillars about um, shortly. They have a number of broods, two broods during the year. Let's see what else we've got. That's an empty egg box. We put the egg boxes in here so that they can sort of... Ah, there's something in here. Probably a bit difficult to see. I might have to tap it out. But this is a micro moth. We mustn't disregard our little micro moths. Ah yes, beautiful. I don't know if you can see that. This is actually an Indian meal moth. Um, beautiful red head and sort of pale yellow on it. So that that's a bit of a warning to me that I better make sure my household goods are uh, secure. They like to eat your flour and your rice and your oats. Um, but Moths are very misunderstood, I see, feel, and that's one of my reasons for being interested in them. There's only about four out of 9,000 species that actually eat your clothes, and the rest of them eat very highly specialised things, um, which we are doing our best with our intensive agriculture to um, make it harder for them to find. Here we've got a heart and dart, a lovely little moth is sort of wandering off. They're very common, again, a species that can be found um, throughout Britain and in your gardens and things. Um, it's not much in this trap today. It was a bit windy last night. Oh yes, here's some lovely things. So here we've got, a, looks like a, um, a cetaceous Hebrew character. Um, there are some wonderful histories to the the rich history to the names of moths so we might take him downstairs and look at it later this one oh yes here we've got a um it looks like it's a pale shouldered brocade a very striking a beautiful uh resident moth so um i'll just put him back see what else we've got um I have a background in textiles, so all these moths that are called carpets and brocades, and that's in a way how I got into mothing in the first place. I thought of it in the way that textile designers do, as oh, inspired by nature. And then once I, oh, nothing much there, a bit too windy. Once I started really studying them, I, I, I moved beyond the, let's, uh, oops, hold on a minute, let's, uh, you know, use their patterns and let's and I move towards let's find out a lot more about them and it's really changed my artistic practice so there's not much in the old Skinner um, it's it's a little bit gappy now and I think things escaped <laughs> during the night because it's walked all the times I've left it out in the rain so let's go see what's in the this is my new exciting quite new oh I can see something very exciting already um, well, all moths are exciting to me, but you can see the signs of, of an unmistakable and rather wonderful visitor. Um, so this is a lime hawk moth, 
try and lift it out without disturbing it too much. These large creatures can be quite docile during the day, but the heat, because it's, it's night time now, let's have a look at you. The wind is disturbing in there, you'll be sort of asleep. So yes, a lime hawk moth. Um, they are quite common in London this time of year. You might also see their caterpillars, which are amazing, green and yellow striped with a bright blue horn on their tail. I did see one marching down the road last year to Font Hill Road on the, on the, underneath a, a birch, um, uh, birch street tree. So that must be one of its food plants, which I've subsequently looked up, but they do eat birch as well as um, limes. Um, and other local, oh, hang on. Oh, we've got another amazing thing here, which is another hawk. This is, this is an eyed hawk moth. Um, it might, when it, um, you just disturbed it, but it might flash the lovely pink eyes, which are behind its, on its behind wings. Um, if it gets disturbed, but I don't want to disturb it. I'm just going to put the, the camera down for one second so I can... Sorry about that. So I've just put that moth back and I can see something struggling in the corner here. Um, oh, he's right at himself. Let me say him all the time. This is a, <laughs> um, that looks like it's a, a white ermine moth, which is making a break for the dark. Um, obviously, we've disturbed his uh, daytime rest. Here he is. Um, oh, there's something else in there. Oh, dear, I might have just lost that one. <laughs> um, it, there is a, a slight danger to leaving it this late in the day. Um, yes, I think that's a white ermine, so I'll, I'll, I'll get him out and we can have a better look at him. I think there's something else there, which um, I will extract. So, we're getting a little bit windblown up here on the roof, so what I'm going to do is um, take some of these down um, and see you in a minute where we can look at them in a bit more, at a bit more leisure. So, see you in a minute. While we're waiting for Catherine to come down, um, I'm going to uh, go through some slides of uh, some uh, moths that we've seen in the, in the recent, in the last few days. Um, so I'm going to share the screen so you can have a look at these. Um, and this will be a chance to have a bit more of a close up of uh, what, we're, what you can see um, flying at the moment. So I'm sure Catherine will be able to tell us a bit more about these. Fortunately, there are um, some uh, uh, captions on these. But first of all, this is a, a, a video of the um, traps going on at night. So um, this is what they look like during the night and what the moths are attracted to. So um, you'll see them coming on. So that's the white trap that um, has these two bulbs on them. The lights that are in the traps can be quite dangerous to look at. So Catherine often wears sunglasses at night to uh, go and look at them. Um, so those are the traps. Um, move on to the next slide. Um, so this is a pale tussock and um, uh, this is a typical uh, type of moth that you might find at this time of year. So they're all, they're very seasonal, they're very local, and they have very specific food plants, a lot of them. Again, I'm sure Catherine will be able to tell us a bit more about those once she's uh, got uh, her um, collection together. Um, and the next one, this is an angle shades. So there was an angle shades in the uh, trap this morning. So probably have a closer look at that. And also a silver Y. And you can see this is called a silver Y because it has a Y shaped marking on it. Um, the um, and um, there are some uh, more videos I think coming up 
so um, maybe that one's taking a little while to load, so I might move on to the next slide. Just having a little trouble loading this morning. Thought there'd be a, no, uh, nobody else on the internet this morning, but it uh, looks like it's uh, uh, getting a bit uh, overwhelmed already. Um, so, see whether we can get any more of these slides to come up. Right, we might have to go back to some of the ones that we've uh, looked at already. So this is the angle shades and the silver Y. Um, the um, angle shades is a medium sized moth, not, not as big as the hawk moths, which are the most dramatic ones that uh, you might see. And it's kind of peak season for some of those uh, hawk moths at the moment. Uh, the lime hawk moth is a really dramatic creature and one that um, uh, is fairly common at this time of year. Um, it's called um, a lime hawk moth because it feeds predominantly on lime trees, um, but it feeds on other uh, trees as well, which I'm sure Catherine will be able to tell us about. And uh, she was telling me that it actually feeds on plane trees as well. So um, for all those that think plane trees are um, biodiversely um, barren, uh, the plane tree probably isn't as bad as all that after all. Um, and I'm not sure what the silver Y eats, but I know that's a migratory model. Okay, so I think Catherine's ready to, we'll go back to Catherine. So I'm going to mute myself, um, unmute Catherine, and um, you can go, we'll go back. To Hello? Can you see me? Hello, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can hear somebody in the background. I'm not sure I'm doing this on my phone, so it's not um, um, easy to tell what's going on. Right, so um, I'm just going to turn the camera around again. I've just come in, so we've got a little bit more, um, it's less windy, and we can look at some of these beautiful creatures in a bit more detail. Um, I'm hoping that these large beasts will be a little bit more docile in here, but the heat might. Them up so I might actually put it outside so if he does fly away to rest. So let's have a closer look at the eyed hawk moth. Really, is rather a wonderful beast. Um, I put my finger, I can't put my finger, but is it almost the size of my palm? Um, in a way, I hope that this one doesn't open and flash its wings. It'd be lovely to show you the bright pink underwings with the blue eyes, but that might mean that it's a little bit distressed. Um, so very, very, always, always exciting when you get one of the charismatic mega moths. <laughs> Though I, I must um, also have a shout out for the, the beautiful tiny micros, which are dual like. Let's have a look at this lime hawk moth a bit more closely. This looks quite fresh. Wonderful coloration. Um, caught one just a couple of days ago, which was completely different in coloration. I think they are dimorphic. The males and females have slightly different coloration. Um, I think this is a female, um, but I'm not absolutely sure. So those two, the lime hawk moth, it, um, apart from the limes, as I was saying, it eats um, birch trees. I'm just looking at my notes because I get nervous about <laughs> So also elm, alder and birch. So they, they're, they're uh, um, not so specific. That there are some moths that will only eat one food plant, um, but they are um, fairly, fairly polyphagous with trees. So I'm going to leave those now and let's come and look at the rather beautiful Little white um, that is, um, I'm just going to, to leave it like that and not disturb him. Um, and we've also got here this tiny thing, which is rather beautiful. I think that's a marbled miner. It's 
one of those moths that there are lots that are very similar and they they sort of known as aggregates and you have to lump them together. Um, now let's see what else we've got here. Um, again, I, I get very worried about disturbing this too much, digging around in it, but this is the pale shouldered brocade, which is a very, very handsome creature. Let's see if you can see it there closely. I don't think there's anything else. I'm going to leave those down there outside to cool off slightly. So, um, the pale shoulder brocade is a, um, a moth that eats, um, and when I say moth that eats, it's obviously it's the larvae. Um, that's that's larvae feeds on oak and hawthorn. Um, also, smaller shrubs like honeysuckle and broom. Sorry, I've just put the camera down because I want to show you this. Um, maybe I'll take it outside too. This is an angle shade. The angle shade that was in the trap earlier. Now I started doing the, the sort of juddering behaviour, which can be when they're agitated, but also warming up in order to take flight. Oh, it's calmed down a little bit now. I might try and tap, tap them out, but I think they will probably flit quite soon. So they can be very variable. This one is quite pale. It might be um, you know, relatively old, not so fresh. Yes, I think that one is getting ready to fly shortly, so I might just make sure it doesn't fly inside the house. And then there's another little treasure to show you here. Um, sorry about this. This is the pale tussock that we showed you the picture of. I actually caught it yesterday and kept it um, just because it was very docile. Absolutely wonderful. Oh, it's waking up now with a bit of heat. Um, look at the extending those very, very furry front legs. Um, it's, it's absolutely fast asleep. Um, so that was a rather wonderful surprise. They're not too uncommon. Obviously, being in very um, densely populated part of London, um, you have much less abundance of moths than you would in a more um, greener part of the country. But even so, um, it's amazing, it's surprising what you do find uh, uh, living, you know, things that you'd never see. That's one of the things I love about it, that you, it gives you a sort of portal, a way to get in contact with um, the otherness, the hiddenness. Um, and in my work, I'm, I'm using the themes from my research over a number of years, themes to do with um, migration, um, uh, moonlight and pheromones and sex, procreation and nourishment, these sort of essential themes about, um, you know, what we need to thrive in life and flipping it and looking at it from the point of view of these overlooked creatures that we usually think of as um, pests and, and nuisances. And actually they have these highly specialised um, life cycles. Some, some, some insects and moths in particular only eat one particular type of plant and because of um, light pollution, intensive agriculture, loss of habitat, um, their numbers are plummeting. Um, and there was a recent Royal Society uh, report, nature report, just a couple of weeks ago saying that, um, <laughs> someone's asking about my neighbours, yes, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, they have to be very patient. Our neighbours. Sometimes um, I try and let the moths go safely, but uh, um, my neighbour Monique, who's now moved to Canada, she had a cat, and occasionally the cat would, um, if a, a moth who sort of escaped early from the tra trap, it was usually the Jersey tigers, which which come in abundance a bit later in the summer. Um, so yes. The last one of the Urban Tree Festival. So I thought. Um, oh, I can hear, is that someone asking a question? Anyway, um, yeah. 
Shall we go to questions? Yeah. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute the camera. I'm going to unmute me and I'm going to invite Catherine to come round uh, the wonder of the internet means that Catherine is here with me. So um, that's, uh, I'm going to uh, move on to questions. So let's um, uh, get those questions coming in the chat. And if anybody's got some questions, and I saw quite a few earlier, and I saw Carol had quite a few. So um, Hi, Carol. I might move to you, Carol, and just get you, unmute you if you want to ask your questions. Yeah, I was um, curious. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to take... Sorry, Carol, if you want to start again. Yeah, um, I was curious, Catherine, to know whether you made those boxes yourself. Do you know I didn't, but I'm going to, because I think they'd be very easy. Um, um, they were both actually presents. The first one I got, I think about seven years ago, which is um, a lovely present, but they could be very easily made. Um, I think you go down to your local makerspace or fab lab, or if you've got a jigsaw, um, that those are both skinner traps and um, the, ply, the plywood one could be jigged out. Um, you can order perspex on the, on the internet and you just need to buy the, um, uh the, ele the electrics the the light and the um outdoor cable um from um uh, a lepidopterist supplier i think it's anglian lepidoptery supplies is the one um so absolutely should make make um make our own it's very easy to do and very satisfying and um portable I, I um i took it on holiday the, the big wooden one um up to sky once and we were there in a heat wave and i happened to record lots and lots of rare things that had never been recorded there before and the local local uh, moth fraternity were really annoyed with me but it was just because i happened to be in a part of an un uh, a low inhabited um, part of the island where no one had done any trapping before and there was exceptional weather and it was and I and I made a contribution to science so I was, I was thrilled but yes you can easily make them and I, I should and I will and I hope you do too. No, I think I, I will have a go because we have um, in our community garden um, somebody mm -hmm. quite few of them have got good DIY skills. Yeah. So, um, I think that's something that we yeah. do. The skin and, trap and is Absolutely. Any book recommendations, particularly for youngsters? Yes. Um, upwards. Might have to switch my camera back on, and I can. Oh, okay, okay. No, they're all laid out here, oh, okay. so I can. Yeah, the magic of the internet, where uh, social distancing rules don't apply. <laughs> you may have gathered that uh, Catherine and I are connected. Um, Sound off. So I think uh, you're going to show us the books. Have to switch the camera around. I'll just bring Yeah, okay. So if you've got any other questions while Catherine's doing that, put them in the chat and we'll Sorry, get Sorry, I had them. them all laid out on the table, but um, so this is this book. Um, oh, that's not working. You have to hold it close to you. Oh, I have to hold it close to you. Yeah, cool. Um, this book by Chris Manley um, is the one that first got me into um, the moth because it's just full of life site um, living photos. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I had this book and I was just, I think I was still looking at it three years later. <laughs> um, so that's a good one, Chris Manley. Um, I think there's been two editions of that. Um, these 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 guides which are illust oh sorry illustrated so the manly's great because it's live photographs but these are all um there's hundreds of these guides which are um 
the field, Bloomsbury Wildlife Field Guides, and they're all um, these fabulous uh, illustrations by Richard Lewington. So they're really, really good. There's, there's ones for caterpillars recently, micro moths, and that's a really, that's a really useful um, ID book. Whoops. Um, so I recommend that one. And then not so much for um, young children, sorry, going out in the green screen, but, but this, is a, this is an amazing atlas that has all the sort of scientific data collected over the last um, 50, 50 years, in some cases longer. Um, so that's a really good reference book once you're a bit more into your data. And it has these um, maps and it tells you about decline and um, shifts in population things moving northwards with climate change and all of that sort of thing heat maps so that's um, really really great um, um, sort of bible really so there's some books um, and there are some more friendly um, you know pull out guides and things you can get which are great for children because there's, there's far more moths, um, local you know, UK moths than there are butterflies so there's a lot more things to learn and be surprised by. Thank you so much, appreciate that, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I noticed someone is just saying that they can't see Catherine so if you go to the Urban Tree Festival uh, one you can see her on that one um, and some other questions which are coming up are, um, I think... Uh, oh, someone's you... asking about, do you do it every night? Yeah. Does it disturb their being? Yes, um, I don't do it every night because that you might catch the same moth. Um, I try and leave a couple of days in between and release the moth safely. Yeah, um, absolutely. Doing something like this makes you so, so um, aware of how clumsy it can be. There, are, there can be occasional uh, you know, fatalities. You, something has expired in the box or you know, um, I have um, sometimes crushed something by accident and, and you feel so responsible. So it's very important to um, just um, dip into their lives for a short amount of time so that you can record them um, because it, we're doing this for biodiversity wildlife recording purposes and send them off to your local county moth recorder, let them go safely. I'm also aware that there are lots of uh, birds on our roof, so I normally bring them down um, onto our terrace, which is more sheltered, um, and leave them in a sheltered spot so that when they wake up in the evening, they can uh, fly off. But you do have to, um, yeah, if, if, we're, if we're after protecting uh, wildlife, the last thing we want to do is take them out of their breeding cycles and um, and, and, and murder them. <laughs> so I, I try not to do it. Um, so yeah, loads of things coming in. Um, <clears throat> I hope that Gillian's managed to uh, figure out how to get Catherine on her screen. Um, yes, I might. And uh, Mel's asking what's the length of life of moths? Oh, it really varies. Um, some will, um, so, so that some have multi brood, so some might go through two or even three generations in a summer. You know, caterpillars eating, f flying, procreating. Um, some overwinter as an egg or as a larva, a pupa, or some as an adult. So it's difficult to know. Um, some can live months, some will only live a matter of days, and um, uh, Actually, moth life cycles, are, um, even though we learn all about them at school, um, are very understudied. So there are a lot of, lot of species that people still don't know what their food plant is in the wild or, or how long they actually live in um, nature. Um, so it varies, yeah, from a few days to some months. And then there's this wonderful um, Arctic woolly bear moth, um, which lives for 26 years as a caterpillar. It, 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 it's so, it's um, breeding time, it's eating time is so short in that part of the world that it, um, it literally freezes over in the winters and it wakes up and eats just for a few um, days or weeks and it freezes over and it takes, does that for up to about 26 years. And then when it actually um, hatches and flies away, the adult life um, stage is only a few days. So when we think about the life, the, li the length of life of moths, some of them are in the metamorphic stages for much longer than they are as adults. And that's part of the fascination really. <clears throat> and um, the other, another one was um, Thans asking, is the larvae which feed on specific trees or adults at two, 
So do adults and caterpillars both feed? Ah, yes. Yeah. So some some moths, some of the larger moths, not these, um, some of the early sort of um, what they call primitive moths, um, which have you know evolved a long time ago, have no mouth parts at all as an adult. They just um, they they just uh, are on the wing to to mate and and live for a few days. But um, when we talk about food plants, we're really talking about the caterpillars, the larvae. But of course. Um, Adult moths do feed on nectar, so um, the, when we're talking about food plants, we're talking about eating buds and, and, and leaves and sometimes bark um, in the caterpillar stages. But this, this, this um, Royal Society report that was um, done a couple of weeks ago was saying that, um, again, moths have been very un understudied and they've been, um, their role as pollinators has been massively underestimated because people are so used to looking at bees and other other um, flying insects um, and the heads um, and they completely disregarded the fact that um, moths carry huge amount of pollen on their bodies and they and they are playing this massive role because they're, they're much more abundant at night and they and they cross pollinate a huge amount of flowers and that shows that as an adult they are feeding a lot on nectar um, sometimes I can revive some um, tired looking moths in the moth trap by um, making a very weak um, honey solution. And that, um, sometimes I, I think you have to be expert to do this. I'd be very wary. Um, you can sort of gently unfurl the proboscis and, 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 and they feed on the, the sugar and revive themselves and then fly off. <clears throat> um, so any uh, other questions? Sorry, um, can I just ask uh, sort of additional question to that? There's some sort of flowers which produce a scent at night sort of things like Dane's Vine and things. I want, so presumably they would be sort of evolved to entice nocturnal insects like moths, or is that? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, um, and the classic one is, is, is Darwin and, and the Madagascan orchid and, and, and the moth who developed this very long pro 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 proboscis. Um, so yes, night-scented flowers, absolutely. And if you want to um, attract um, moths those are some of the plants that they suggest the night scented stocks nic nic nicot nicotina. nicotina um so absolutely i think that's it and um sometimes i go out with um some other volunteers down at woodbury wetlands and we go and look at the ivy by night with a torch um sometimes we see absolutely nothing but but apparently that sends out a night scent and has this very sticky um uh, dew which keeps an awful lot of insects going through that late summer early autumn period so scent I mean um, moths um, the whole thing about moths being uh, drawn to light but actually they're drawn by pheromones to each other very so scent is a very powerful thing with moths that's how they how they um, find find uh, their partners thank you yeah any other questions? If you if you want to unmute yourself, it's not a. I think it's early enough in the morning, and we're civilized enough to be able to unmute ourselves, perhaps to uh, ask questions. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Oh, thank you. It's a very niche subject, so I like to when people understand and they don't think I'm total nutter. <laughs> I have the same sort of trap as you. And um, funnily enough, I have a background in textile, so it's all very interesting. Yes, there's a, there is a real connection, I think. I think they're, they're very, um, moths and butterflies are so textile-like with their, um, their scales and their patterns. I think we're naturally drawn to them. And I, I, it really was a challenge to me to not just stop at that first stage of going, ooh, colourway, and think, actually, what, you know, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps I can direct my creative urges into learning a bit more and it's taken me on a completely different path it's sort of become entangled and I'm doing a PhD now so <laughs> one of the things I think is wonderful is the fact that it's, um, the names are so fabulous of the moths yes. they're wonderful names and they do actually describe the moth in many cases which is they do there's an absolutely wonderful history behind the names it goes back to the um, the sort of 18th century Aurelians, you know, the, 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 um, the gentleman um, insect hunters in those early days when people were discovering um, 
sort of taxonomy of plants and animals and they've got these wonderful half Greek half Latin names um, as well as the the local names um, and they're wonderful um, yes the cetaceous Hebrew character which I'm afraid flew off so I'm gonna have to catch him he's somewhere in our house um, and, uh, all the carpets and the brocades and um, the chimney sweeper. There are some really wonderful stories behind the, the names. It's very inspiring. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. um, so is it, Jill's asking, so is it only the night scented flowers which get pollinated by moths? Or do they pollinate others? Yes, they pollinate a huge, a huge range. It's not just the, the, the night scented um, the ones that we think of as powerfully night scented um, brambles um, that that study I was talking about it was it was it was mentioned in the Guardian I think it's sort of the 12th of May so um, it's quite easy to look up back up um, they just cover a huge range of um, herbaceous plants and flowering plants and trees um, and they found you know up to the pollen of about 56 different species on the body of one moth <laughs> because it was, people have been looking in the wrong place before so um, uh, yeah flowers that bloom in the daytime yes yeah absolutely all flowers um i mean i'm not an expert botanically on exactly which flowers but yes it's it's not just night night flowering flowers um, yeah, someone's asking about the Arctic woolly moth. It's on that. It's on one of those David Attenborough um, Arctic programs. You can look it up if you Google Arctic woolly bear moth. It's a very beautiful little story. <clears throat> I was wondering about how many there are because the 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 numbers in the books are, you know, there's hundreds. It's not like number of trees, for instance, where we can know all the species and uh, you know someone like me who's a tree nerd can memorize pretty much all the trees but uh, How? In, with moths there seem to be you know, people many, do many memorize hundreds. them I think there's about nine thousands of the uh, nine thousand macro moths in the UK but then we also get that's one of the other beautiful things about um, doing um, you know the, the connection to nature thing is that you, you you begin to really be aware of the seasons so then there are also lots of immigrant um, or, or shall I say migrant moths that come over the with the winds um, from the continent in the late summer so that will add a number of species um, and then there are thousands of micro moths so I, I um, also I'm not as I'm not as um, um, I suppose list minded to learn them all quite in the same way as some of you tree people um so uh, i i perhaps haven't tried to expand my my thorough knowledge in that way i'm learning them as i come across them and get to know them but yes i think you could you know entomologists would know almost all and there, there are wonderful people on twitter who you can in fact i did it the other day with one of the micros and send a picture and go what's this please and they come back instantly and say that's uh eupithecia strangulata or whatever it's called so um um it's definitely possible what about um the sort of region spe specificity of them because a lot of them you'll only find in certain parts yes of the country. that's what's so fascinating about the the oh. atlas um, some are so localized now um, in probably probably always to do with habitat which goes right back to the geology um, and and microclimates as well as plants that are available highly highly specific but also since landscapes have become fragmented there are some things that um, are, are highly localized and when you probably can't see this very closely but just open the book at random um, the atlas and on these maps, um, this moth is a, a red-headed chestnut. That's reasonably common. Oh, the one next to it, black spotted chestnut. I mean, there are three or four little dots right down by the Thames estuary. And that seems to be only where it's been recorded now. And there's some things that will only live in Scotland. They are um, highly evolved to specific conditions um, so some are doing the picture is complex some are doing really well with climate change and their their ranges are expanding and some are um, very very under threat because um, we have hardly left them anything to eat or anywhere to live <laughs> if I want to put it in a um, 
in an emotional way. So um, that's one of the fascinations about looking at any sort of particular part of nature. Once you start looking closely, you realize how it's connected to all the other um, elements and how much human action is, is impacting it. So um, any other questions? Uh, if you have, um, day flying moths as well, yes. Yes, the hummingbird hawk moth, isn't it wonderful? It is like a small hummingbird. Yeah, um, the silver Y, um, oh, we didn't have one today, but I think we showed a picture which are very common and they're actually a migrant moth. Um, they famously were the ones that landed on the football stadium in the Stade de France, I think it was about five years ago, and um, um, being drawn to the light. Um, and um, they, are, they can be day flying moths as well. You can quite often see them on lavender and things. There are quite a few, there are quite a few um, that fly during the day. There's not really any essential difference between butterflies and moths. They are the same family, but um, we've categorized them in that way. I mean, there are um, subtle differences, but they are all the same family. <clears throat> So, uh, I think that might be the end of the questions, mm. is it? Okay, well, thank you everybody and thank you, Catherine. That was fascinating yeah. and it's certainly something which, uh, well, I, I have a bit of an insight into it, but uh, there, it's, it's something which I'm sure many of us have very little understanding of um, moths and I certainly didn't know much about them until Catherine uh, became very interested in them and it's, a, it's an amazing hidden world really and you described it as fishing in the sky which mm. I think is a wonderful um, description of, of what you're doing to kind of yeah we no longer stick them on pins and collect them in drawers we just you know briefly photograph them and let them be mm. <laughs> yeah um, so I think I've put some links in the chat to Catherine's uh, Twitter and Instagram and her website um, and there's a link and her profiles on the Urban Tree Festival website as well. So if anybody wants to find out more or yeah. contact her. If anyone wants to buddy up and form a moth group, I'm always, I'm always keen to have a... Um, urban moth yeah. fraternity. Um, so I think one, I'll, I'll just uh, share my screen again. Thank because you, Thank you. I've got um, one yes. last... Uh, image to show you which I was trying to show you earlier but it didn't work but this is the eyed hawk moth um, with its eyes showing uh, and you can see a, a, just how large it is next to that pound coin uh, so hopefully that's uh, something that we um, were trying to show you earlier um, so yes thank you all very much for coming um, a few uh, urban tree festival things as well as I've already mentioned it's the last day of the festival, so do join the um, three more activities. Mel's um, doing her meditation in about an hour and a quarter, so join that to uh, uh, relax again after this early excitement. Um, great trees at two and write about trees at four. Um, so thank you all very much for joining. Uh, the one final, final thing is, of course, um, if you're able to make a donation to the festival, that would be very, very much appreciated. Um, and um, I uh, hope to see you, some of you, a bit later. And uh, we'll end it in a minute. So um, thank you all for coming, getting up so early on a Sunday morning. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, bye bye. Thank um, you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Oh, I was Hello. going to unmute everybody so you could just oh. make a little bit of uh, early morning noise. And <laughs> we can thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.